Written in black ink. Investigators probing the background of the Stockton Three Elementary Three School gunman are making bizarre discoveries. And while most didn't, some Stockton parents brought their young kids back to school one day after the deadly shooting that left five youngsters dead. For others, today was a time to remember those children who will never return to school. And in Miami, there may finally be an end to the violence inside, although tonight was by no means quiet. We we'll have those stories all the news on this Wednesday night, January 18th, 1989. Live from Channel 2 and first in the Bay Area, this is the award-winning 10 o'clock news, the number one primetime newscast in the country. Good evening, I'm Elaine Corral. And I'm Dennis Richmond. Eleven of the injured students from yesterday's deadly shooting rampage at Stockton Elementary School are still in hospitals tonight, but already the focus has shifted somewhat to their attacker. Some children filed back to their classrooms today at the urging of psychologists and teachers. As they did, investigators were revealing what their probe discovered into the background of Patrick Purdy. Purdy is a 27-year-old loner who took his own life after turning the school's playground into something resembling a battlefield. Five children died when investigators found in a search of Purdy's rented room shed little light on why he attacked the children. In fact, what they discovered may have even deepened the mystery. Randy Shandable has our report. The more we learn about Patrick Edward Purdy, the more grotesque it gets. Police say for the past three weeks, Purdy stayed in this Stockton motel off Highway 99. Inside this room, police say they found ammunition and something very strange. That there had to be a hundred little plastic army men, a couple of jeeps and a tank that were spread out through the entire room up on top of uh, the uh, drapes, in the shower, one in the freezer. Journalists from around the nation crowded near a Stockton police captain today as he revealed new details about yesterday's unexplainable massacre. It turns out this killing field was once Purdy's own playground. He attended Cleveland Elementary School from kindergarten through third grade and once lived on American Avenue nearby. Though police know of no reason Purdy might hold a grudge against the school. And though most of his victims were Asian, police have found no evidence of anti-Asian bias. Why he did this, we may never know. He obviously developed a military hang-up. Uh, I understand in some conversations he spoke about Vietnam, but he's obviously too young to have went to Vietnam. The killing machine was this AK-47 with bayonet. Carved into the barrel was the word Hezbollah, the name of an Iranian terrorist group. There were also the words freedom and victory. On ammo clips were other slogans, including evil and humanoids. There were PLO slogans on Purdy's camouflage clothing. And police found this in his motel room. And it has drawn on it some pictures and written in black ink at the top, V for victory, and at the bottom, F for freedom. People often assume mass killers just snap or something. Patrick Purdy did not just snap yesterday. He planned it. Wearing a flak jacket to protect himself, carrying hundreds of rounds of extra ammunition, specifically going to his old school, and apparently trying to divert police with a Molotov cocktail to his own car. Made up of a Budweiser beer bottle filled with gasoline with a fuse type material stuck in it. Police say Purdy had trouble keeping jobs, working for a couple months last year at this machine shop, working for just one month at another machine shop. His former foreman says he just walked out one day. But he did a lot of cleanup, and he wasn't satisfied with the work that he was doing. So in this shop, he kind of had, what, the equivalent of the grunt work? Yeah. And he didn't like it? No, he didn't like it. He, whenever he was told to do something, he... Um, had a sour look on his face. Yeah, he talked pretty much about uh, about when he was when he was young, growing up and stuff. That he didn't have too much of a family life, and uh, he kind of lived all over the nation. Lived in Hawaii. He lived everywhere, and he never had it really easy. That's did he, did he complain about his parents? Uh, he said his mom was an alcoholic. He didn't even know where she lived. Former coworkers said Purdy complained he had no friends, no social life. He told them he would just work 
go back to a small motel room, sleep, and come back to work. But a man who lived next door to Purdy in one of those motel rooms paints a different picture. He was um, in and out all night long, all day long, uh, real skittish, uh, not too friendly. Doing drugs? Yeah, I'm sure he was. Nobody could stay up and all night and all day and not be doing drugs. An autopsy is being done on Patrick Purdy to see if he indeed was under the influence of drugs yesterday. Other than that, police consider this case essentially closed. They say they're almost certain that Purdy acted alone, that no one helped him in any way. In Stockton, Randy Shandabel for the 10 o'clock news. A broken home, a history of childhood drinking, and a long criminal record may have been warnings, but they still don't explain why Patrick Purdy took aim at so many innocent children. Purdy's 63-year-old grandmother, who lives 15 miles south of Stockton in Lodi, figures her grandson's motive died with him. Julia Chumbley told a reporter through her screen door she could not believe it when she heard the news yesterday. She said the whole thing is like a nightmare. No, I mean, it's, yeah, I was in shock all day yesterday. I didn't feel like talking. I still don't like, I still don't feel like talking. Um, it was a sad thing. And it, and it's... Mrs. Chumbley said her grandson came to visit about twice a year using her address to collect his mail, and she said there were never any problems. He always would, I'm sorry. He always acted fairly decent when he was here. That's all I can say about that. Mrs. Chumbley said when Patrick was a child, he only had a normal childlike interest in guns and as far as she knew, was not prejudiced against Asians. She also said, sadly, I know there are a lot of victims, but we are victims too. Patrick Purdy's stepmother also talked to reporters today in Lockerford, north of Stockton. Carol Masterson said her stepson looked like his father and acted like his father. Both, she said, were loners, both quiet, reserved, and standoffish. The father, who was killed in a car accident in 1981, had been in the service, but a According to his wife, had been released because of a psychological disability. Masterson said she believes her stepson had a definite reason for going to that school and committing yesterday's massacre. I think something happened at that school or in that area, and he went back. He couldn't handle it any longer. He had kept it inside and hadn't talked to anyone. I honestly believe it. And I don't know what makes my conviction that. But there was a reason he got into alcohol and or drugs and it could have stemmed back to when he was going to that school. Masterson said she thinks her stepson kept things inside him for as long as he could and then just exploded. The man who wrote the book Mass Murder, America's Growing Menace, said today that mass murderers are angry at the world for a lifetime of frustrations and blame everyone else for their problems. James Allen's Fox said before they die, they want revenge. And what better way than to take children with them, the most vulnerable and the most dear to us? Another expert said mass murderers who prey on children actually think like children. They live the way most eight-year-olds do in a world of uh, zooming planes and my soldiers can get your so soldiers. But most of us who don't live our lives in Rambo movies and who do believe maybe a kinder and gentler America may come someday, give that up to some degree. Or we get it out through watching the 49ers on TV and yell, kill the ref. We don't go kill kids. The chief psychologist for the San Diego Police Department called Purdy's rampage yesterday a grandstand suicide, where the gunman says to the world, I am important, look at me. When the gunman opened fire on the children yesterday, Janet Gang, a teacher at Cleveland Elementary, was on playground duty with one other teacher. Tonight, she's in a hospital bed. She was the only adult hit by the withering gunfire. She at first thought she was hearing firecrackers until the students began screaming and falling. She then turned, looked across the playground, and saw a chilling sight. I looked around and I saw a guy standing out by the sixth grade portables. I didn't see his face. It seems like he had sunglasses on. But he was in a stance like you see um, soldiers, I mean, the type of military stance with a gun, policeman stance with a gun right in front of him. And it was just total popping. I mean, I could see rocks flying. King at first told the kids to get down as the gunman continued to pepper the playground with shots. But realizing he was still shooting at them, she told them to run for the building. She too ran, but a bullet stopped her. I felt the shot in my leg and then I went down. And I, I could see partly around me, I could see kids laying and the other kids had run into the building. But I was laying there with my back to him and I could still hear him going off and I thought, he's gonna shoot me anytime, Dad. I just, you know, you, 
laying with your back to this guy shooting. You thought you were going to die? Yeah. yeah. I thought he... Well, moments later, the gunman took his own life. Jing was spared. She suffered a bullet wound in the hip. She will need an operation. Asked if she could go back into the classroom. She answered yes, but that's when I'll break down. Other teachers were back in the classroom today at Cleveland Elementary School doing what they could to comfort their students. The school was open, although most of the children weren't there. But La Cuesta has our reports. Some children did return to Cleveland Elementary School today, but not many. Only about 200 out of an enrollment of almost 1,000. Counselors, teachers, and administrators personally greeted as many children as they could. Officials wanted the healing process to begin. We're going to try to make this as normal as we possibly can. But it is not normal for traumatized children to have to run the gauntlet of the waiting media, drawn here to chronicle a story that can't be ignored. I'm upset that there's a lot of reporters here and it's difficult for the kids to get through. I'm upset that the children um, had to go through this trauma and the children were killed. Some parents who brought their children to school today talked about how their children acted last night, even once back in the safety of their homes. They were scared. Uh, they didn't want to go outside. They didn't want to stray too far from us. and uh, this, They were just shaken. Some parents said because their children had been so violently pulled from their childhood world yesterday, they had to bring them back to Cleveland Elementary School today. I didn't want him to be afraid, you know, he was terrified as it was, and hopefully getting him back in the routine, you know, he'll adjust better. But it's not just the children that need to readjust their lives. Teachers, parents, this whole community is suffering. And for those trying to help, coping is made more difficult because some of the victims and survivors are Southeast Asian refugees, immigrants already burdened by the past they fled and the new land and language they are trying to adapt to. She didn't understand English, and I was looking for a translator. But finally, the only two words that she could muster from her vocabulary was she die, question mark. It almost sounded like something from her language, the way she put it so quickly. She died, question mark. And so yes, she did. School officials say they will continue this special counseling until every child is helped. We will work with our children to come to accept and, and handle what has happened at Cleveland School. And by midday, there were children back in the same playground that was a scene of such horror just 24 hours earlier. There were still scars for the children to look at, bullet holes in walls, but holes that are now being patched up. The playground was once again for the children a playground where gunman Patrick Purdy had himself played as a child 20 years ago. He was a student here from kindergarten to the third grade. This man is no longer alive. This man will no longer harm us or our children or your children or anyone's children anywhere. Tomorrow will be another day of school at Cleveland Elementary. In Stockton, Lloyd LaQuesta for the 10 o'clock news. In Stockton tonight, people directly touched by the tragedy and those who are simply reaching out to comfort others gathered for a memorial service. It was one of many steps towards recovering from an explosion of violence that no one could possibly have been prepared for. John Fowler was at tonight's memorial and is standing by now in Stockton with a live report. John. Elaine, people say the shock, the grief, the loss has yet really to settle in. It is only a few yards from the school where yesterday the gunman's bullets felled those children to the Lutheran church where tonight those children were mourned. It was a service of remembrance and healing. There were songs of hope. There were tears in an emotional service tonight. People struggling to cope with a tragic disorder of life. We are simply not prepared to be grieving for our children. They were parents and students, and staff from the school, and friends and strangers from the community. I grieved with the women who were standing next to me. I, I didn't know them, but I know that we all, any mother shares that tragedy. Any mother who has ever had a five-year-old ch child can imagine that child and experience that tragedy and feel for those families. 
Those little kids were coming to school to learn. They came to this country to learn something, to learn how to be free, learn what it's all about, learn respect for one another, and they never had a chance. Stockton is culturally diverse, but this tragedy hit hardest the Asian community, especially Cambodian immigrants. Tonight, they mourned for their dead children, six-year-old Sok Him An, six-year-old Ram Chun, eight-year-old Oyen Lim, eight-year-old Rathanan Or, and six-year-old Tui Tran. We are part with their family. And you know, like you share their grief with them. Yes, right, right. All day long, people placed flowers on the Cleveland Elementary School sign. It became a shrine to those murdered children, to those innocents, senselessly cut down in the early blossom of their lives. Stuck. Stockton police have removed the flowers now and inside the school is literally a room full of bouquets and balloons and sprigs brought here right up until just a short while ago. We should reiterate of the 30 wounded, 10, I'm sorry, 11, remain in the hospital. Four of them, including teacher Janet Gang, are in fair condition, the rest listed as stable. Also, the principal and her staff continue to meet here at the school presumably on how best to deal with the children when they return to class tomorrow. Dennis Elaine. All right, thanks very much, John. That was John Fowler reporting live from Stockton. Now, a trust fund has been established to help pay medical costs for the shooting victims. If you would like to help, you can send contributions to the Cleveland School Trust Fund, Bank of Stockton, 301 Minor Street, Stockton, California. Zip code is 95202. Now, we'll be showing this address again a little later in the newscast during one of our commercial breaks. And later on, we'll have a report on the city of Stockton and on the controversy over the weapon used in yesterday's massacre. Straight ahead on 10 o'clock news, Bob McKenzie went to Stockton today to learn about the farming town that's been pushed into the national spotlight. And George Watson reports on the battle over the deadly weapon used in yesterday's shooting. We'll be right back. Yesterday's schoolyard massacre in Stockton focused national attention on a quiet Central Valley community that until now has mostly steered clear of the limelight. It was best known as an agricultural center. The port of Stockton loaded fresh California produce onto ships from around the world. But in the past few years, there have been quiet and dramatic changes in Stockton and the people who live there. Bob McKenzie has a report. Stockton is the hub of the mostly rural economy of the San Joaquin Valley. In the past 10 years, it has also become the hub of Southeast Asian immigration into the United States. 30,000 refugees have come to stay, turning battered public housing into Southeast Asian villages. Their presence in such numbers puts a strain on local welfare services, on the school system, and on the nerves of some of their neighbors. There are frequent instances of harassment. If they walk on the street, the people will roll their vent cars window and then yelling at them. These are the boat people of Vietnam, refugees from the killing fields of Cambodia and Laos. The first refugees came here because they thought they could farm here. They didn't realize that you can't farm here unless you own land. Later arrivals came to be near their relatives. Their sense of family is very strong. Many of the adults remember seeing friends or family members slaughtered before their eyes. Though they are often bewildered in this strange new land, at least they have felt sure that here they and their children were safe. Today, almost all the parents in the Park Village settlement kept their children at home. Few adults speak English, and few have more than a vague understanding of the culture they now reside in. To some, yesterday's massacre sounded like the kind of atrocity they fled from years ago. They feel, they feel like um, the war is going on again, you know, because we escaped from our country, we saw that it's safe here. And right now it's like, you know, we, since then we, we don't have anything happen like this. We, so it's right now it just happened, so it's, we feel like it's not safe for us. They feel like that they uh, escape from the fire and hopefully come to the cooler place. And then they find that and reminds them what they've been through. In a Cambodian village, one's extended family includes cousins, uncles and aunts, neighbors. These people have gathered to mourn little Ram Chun, one of the children killed in the playground. Her brother says she was a bright student who spent her afternoons studying. 
I just feel upset for her, cry out for her, keep thinking about her. I wish she were back, but I know she won't be back, you know. I just wish she's, I hope she's okay, you know. Outside another apartment, mourners stare at the picture of So Kim Ahn, mowed down along with the others. Her mother, Kor Ning, apparently tried to kill herself last night, running into the street in front of approaching cars. She was taken to a hospital. For some refugees who expected their children to realize the American dream, yesterday's massacre seems aimed at all of them. They feel, they feel like uh, they hate us. There is no evidence that Patrick Purdy set out to kill Southeast Asian children, and since he is dead, we may never know what was on his mind. But for the people here, the facts speak for themselves. Five Southeast Asian children dead, many others wounded. It's the kind of nightmare they thought they had left behind forever. In Stockton, Bob McKenzie for the 10 o'clock news. What happened in Stockton yesterday is reopening the long simmering debate about the relative ease with which semi-automatic weapons can be bought. Critics say the regulations are so lax that just about anyone can walk into a store and within minutes legally buy a rifle better suited for combat than anything else. George Watson reports. An AK-47 assault rifle is designed to do exactly what the name implies, assault. There are two versions. The legal semi-automatic version can be fired at 250 to 300 rounds a minute. The illegal fully automatic rifle fires 600 rounds a minute. And it is illegal in California to convert a rifle from semi to fully automatic. But conversion kits are readily available and the conversion process is quick and simple. Every single round packs an incredibly powerful punch. We have cases here in Oakland where they've uh, passed through in, uh, in apartment buildings where they pass through three separate apartments being fired from outside the building. So they'd enter the outside wall, go through three or four interior walls and exit the apartment building. You can buy one of these weapons a lot easier than you can buy a car and it would be only slightly more time consuming than buying a loaf of bread at the corner market. All you need is a driver's license, money, and about five minutes of your time to fill out this federal form. Also, no one is going to see this federal form. It stays on file at the place of purchase. You can purchase this gun along with three 30 round clips of ammunition and of course the bayonet on the front for about $300, $350 on the open market. Yesterday's tragedy in Stockton is providing impetus to people who want to do something about the sale of assault rifles. Don Parada, president of the Alameda County Board of Supervisors, called today for a new state law banning the sale of assault rifles. Supervisors have been working since October on a plan to impose a 15-day waiting period on the purchase of semi-automatic rifles so that potential buyers like Patrick Purdy could be checked out. But Parada now believes that is not enough. He wants those guns out of the marketplace. It would simply recognize in the law that an AK-47, such as the gun that was used yesterday in Stockton, has no place and no purpose in our society other than killing people. And in a civilized society, those are unnecessary uh, weapons for the average citizen to have. I'm sympathetic with the NRA as far as the ban goes. Uh, but as, as far as the waiting period goes, uh, I, know, I know they won't like me saying that uh, I support it if it's a step that we might try. And like I said, maybe it would have stopped Purdy from, from this tragedy out here in Stockton. The National Rifle Association is against both a ban on sales and a 15-day waiting period. I'm George Watson for the 10 o'clock news. And coming up during our next commercial break, once again, we'll be showing you the address for the trust fund that's been set up for those Stockton shooting victims. And coming up in our next uh, segment, Pat will join us to uh, tell us all about the Dennis weather coming up, right?